keeping the social stability of Britain <coughs> intact. It's not surprising, given this reality, that at the time, Alistair Darling and the Labour government ruled out any radical changes to the financial institutions based on the City of London demanded by the opposition, the opposition parties and the Bank of England. There are around one million people working in the financial services sector in the United Kingdom. And in the past nine years, the sector has contributed tax receipts of 250 billion pounds. I mean, then think about what it doesn't pay and why it's hidden away in tax aids and payments. And you see how much of the, uh, you can't really, really, I suppose the wealth, we'll call it, wealth of this country is in the hands of banks and financial institutions. But they don't produce anything, right? They don't produce any value, they don't produce any production goods, but they can contribute £250 <coughs> billion pounds over this period, right, to taxes. There'll be no caps on bankers' pay. There'll be no breaking up of the largest city institutions. In addition, it's clear that any government in power, Labour, Conservative or Lib Dem, will resist regulations from the European Union aimed at cutting the City of London down to size. Because the City of London right, lies behind the very <coughs> existence of British capitalism and British imperialism. <coughs> The condemned government would never have dared to launch such an attack on the public sector if it thought there would be serious opposition. The Labour Party, as we've seen throughout in Parliament, in the exchanges between uh, Ed Miliband when he's around and uh, Cameron, cannot credibly oppose the spending cuts because in power, it called for the most swinging cuts in public spending in a generation. The trade union movement will be unwilling and unable to amount serious resistance. So the condemned government has had free reign to pick off the poorer sections of the working class before tackling, as it must, wider sections of the working class. And in this process, it has tried and has to some extent succeeded in turning the working class against its own, using arguments, for example, <coughs> capping housing benefits, that families on benefits should not be able to live in better housing than those who work and cannot afford to pay the market rent. This essentially means, by the way, if you think it through, anyone made unemployed or cannot find employment should not have decent housing. That's what that amounts to. And in fact, the figures show that 900,000 people will actually come under the, this, uh, the, these new measures and face possibly losing <coughs> their housing. <coughs> so coming from millionaires with many houses in different parts of the country and even in uh, other countries, this is literally obscene. Restrictions on working tax credits and childcare costs will hit poorer working class families. £50 a week will be withdrawn from the million or so people claiming incapacity benefit for over a year. There will be withdrawal of child benefit for higher rate taxpayers, and this will hit about one and a half million families. Social housing faces the biggest cuts for decades, with the housing budget cut from £8.4 billion to £4.4 billion, nearly 50% over four years. New social housing tele tenants face rental charges up to 80% of market rents. And with 65% of social housing tenants on benefits, this will lead to tens of thousands of families being driven out of their homes. This is the refined cruelty of the British ruling class. We could go on. Let's look at education. The school resources budget will rise by 0.1% a year but with a rise of 2.7% in the school population, this will mean a cut per spending per pupil of around 2.2%. The education department's budget for buildings will be cut by 
the education maintenance allowance to encourage 16 to 90 year, year olds to stay in education will be abolished. 40,000 teachers could lose their jobs as schools are forced to make cutbacks. Mm -hmm. University funding is to be cut by 40% 40, 40 overall, the teaching budget by 80%. And further education is going to be cut by 25%. I mean, these are devastating measures that are planned for the future. In all, some 500,000 public sector workers will lose their jobs, and about the same number in public services outsourced to the private sector. One third of public services, around 80 billion or 5.5% of GDP, are now outsourced to the public sector, a figure expected to grow as the government privatizes more and more public services, opening them up to private profit. Now the poorest parts of the country where the population is more dependent on public spending will suffer most from the spending cuts. You only have to look at the role public spending pays in different parts of the country. Public spending accounts for 57.4% of GDP in Wales, 57.1% in the North East, 50.3% in Scotland, 50.2% in the North West, 42.1% in the South West, and 34% percent in the southeast. Obvious where cuts in public spending are going to hit most. While public sector workers represent 20.8 percent of the workforce, there are 31 percent of, um, of the workforce in Glasgow, 29 percent in Manchester, 39 percent in Liverpool, 33 percent in Sheffield, 25 percent in Leeds, 17% in Birmingham, and 17% in Westminster, London. So if we ignore the extreme inequality between rich and poor in inner London, the coalition's spending cuts undoubtedly will widen the so-called North-South divide. However, spending on the war in Afghanistan will cost more than 15 billion over the next four years. The money will come from a special reserve fund which has already providing 12 billion for the war. Defending Britain's imperialist interests clearly takes priority over the needs of the working class, and this you would expect. The living standards of millions of people in Britain and around the world will be sacrificed to maintain Britain's global interests, the global role of the city, its banks, insurance companies, and other financial institutions. Over the next month or so, the banks will floor their enormous profits and hand out obscene bonuses to their top bankers. This is class war. Brutally demonstrated by the recent statement of the coalition chancellor, multi-millionaire George Osborne, that he would reduce the number of people who claim benefits as a lifetime choice. And he was not referring to the bankers. <laughs> We have no choice but to unite against the system that makes children, the elderly, the unemployed, the overseas worker, the sick and disabled, working men and women and students pay for the crisis, sacrifice to the global interests of British capitalism. Millions of people have to join the fight back and realise there is no capitalist solution to this crisis. The fight now is for a new social system, socialism, uniting together the working class and anti-imperialist movements from all over the world. 